Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is about circumstantial evidence and the ice axe found by Wynne Harris in 1933. As a brief overview, Wynne Harris was a member of the 1933 expedition to Mount Everest. On his summit attempt while climbing from the 1933 high camp, about one hour into the climb, an ice axe was found about 60 feet below the crest of the ridge and 250 yards east of the first step. Wynne Harris left the ice axe there and proceeded to climb the mountain. He turned around at about the same spot Norton turned around in, in 1924. But on the way back down, he passed the ice axe again, picked it up, and left his in its place. Wynne Harris's ice axe has not been seen since, but the ice axe he found was taken back and is held by the Alpine Club. Initially, it was thought to have been Mallory's, but later it was thought to belong to Irvin based on some of the marks found on the axe. In researching the ice axe, I uncovered this photo, which had a more precise location of where the ice axe was found, as well as the routes climbed and returned by the 1933 teams. I had previously mentioned that the ice axe might have been to the east, left in this photo, of the snow slope up to the ridge, but this mark clearly places it just to the west, just a short distance from Green Boots Cave. This is the same location I mentioned in the research items video, except now the box of the potential locations of the ice axe can be narrowed slightly. I will also discuss briefly what this photo says about the theory that Irvin was in the so-called Holzell slot, but was moved by the Chinese, but I'll get into that after I discuss the ice axe when Harris found. The conventional wisdom was that the axe belonged to Andrew Irvin, but it turns out that that determination is highly suspect, and now it is equally likely that the axe belonged to Mallory. I noticed the problems with the ice axe on my recent trip to the National Geographic Museum for their new Everest exhibit. Years ago, Mark Sinnott said that Nat Geo was not releasing the drone footage because they wanted it for their own exhibit. So when the exhibit finally opened, I was interested in whether the drone footage would finally be released, as this could give some insight into what exactly is in the location marked in the final resting place video. As background, in 2019, Nat Geo was able to get a permit from the Chinese government to use a drone on the mountain. As Mark Sinnott describes in his book, The Third Pole, this is a big deal. The Chinese search your bags when you come into the country, and illegally bringing a drone in would be a major problem. Even their drone had difficulty getting in, and it took a great deal of work with the low, lower-level bureaucrats to assure them they had the proper paperwork. Not only did they get a permit to use the drone, but they were able to successfully fly the drone to over 28,000 feet, for which they had special code from the manufacturer to unlock the drone's ability to fly beyond the standard range. In addition, 2019 was a very low snow year, though they did fly the drone up high early in the season when there was still moderate snow coverage. Based on the limited views of the drone pictures that have been released, they appear to be about the same resolution that could be attained from a camera at high camp or even a modern super telephoto from North Cole. However, the angles obtained by the drone are far superior. Researchers have been eagerly awaiting the release of these photos, even offering to pay for their release. Given that Mark Sinnott had said Nat Geo planned to release them as part of an exhibit, one would have hoped we could finally see the photos of the area below the ice axe taken in low snow conditions. I have plenty taken with snow. It is very white. Of course, I was not surprised that not a single image of the search area taken from the 2019 National Geographic Expedition was shown at the exhibit. What I was surprised by was that the entire 2019 Nat Geo search expedition had been erased from Nat Geo's presentation other than a brief statement that a search was done and that it was not successful. Although the Everest exhibit features a drone as well as an interactive uh, television displays, there's no mention of the 2019 search, not a single photo, artifact, anything from their extremely expensive 2019 search. The entire 2019 search expedition had been deleted, like Leon Trotsky, from a Stalin-era photo. Leon Trotsky, being one of the original leaders of the Communist Party in Russia, when Lenin died, coincidentally, in 1924, Trotsky was gradually pushed out of power by Stalin and was exiled from the Soviet Union in 1929. Trotsky eventually moved to Mexico, where he was assassinated in 1940 by a Soviet agent. The assassin, an avid mountaineer himself, used a sawed-off ice axe as the murder weapon. The actual axe is pictured here, the relevance of which will become apparent shortly. The assassination weapon is at the Spy Museum, not the Nat Geo exhibit. One item that was at the Nat Geo Museum is Andrew Irvin's spare ice axe. Irvin, like most of the members of the 1924 expedition, had two ice axes because it is probably the single most useful tool on the mountain. The ice axe in this photo was Andrew Irvin's spare, which was returned to the family along with Irvin's other items. Upon looking at the axe carefully, I noticed that it did not have any of the marks Irvin allegedly used to mark his equipment. 
namely it did not have the three tick marks Irvin was thought to have used to mark his gear. I thought this might be because the marks were on the other side and could not be seen in the exhibit. However, upon looking into it, this axe was known not to have any of the markings that Irvin supposedly used to identify his equipment. In fact, none of his equipment used those marks. Looking into it further, the ice axe found by Wynn Harris in 1933 is by no means conclusively Irvin's, nor any more likely to be Irvin's than Mallory's. The entire belief that it was Irvin's being built up on nothing more than wishful thinking while ignoring all the contrary facts. In order to evaluate the ice axe, I will review the difference between circumstantial and non-circumstantial evidence. Non-circumstantial evidence is called direct evidence. The two are explained in this Ninth Circuit model jury instruction. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as testimony by a witness about what the witness personally saw or heard or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence, that is, it is proof of one or more facts from which one can find another fact. The instructions give us an example. If you wake up in the morning and see that the sidewalk is wet, you may find from that fact that it rained during the night. However, other evidence, such as a turned-on garden hose, may provide a different explanation for the presence of water on the sidewalk. Therefore, before you decide that a fact has been proved by circumstantial evidence, you must consider all the evidence in light of reason, experience, and common sense. All modern forensic evidence, such as DNA, ballistics, etc., is circumstantial evidence and is frequently the best evidence of what happened. For instance, if a man is murdered and your DNA is at the crime scene, the ballistics match your pistol, and you are wearing his watch when you are arrested, you would likely be convicted even though you correctly argue that all the evidence of evidence against you is nothing but circumstantial. This would likely still be the case even if you took the stand and stated you could not have committed the crime because you were at home watching Michael Tracy YouTube videos all night. Although your testimony would be direct evidence and thus not circumstantial, the jury would still likely convict you even though they were not 100% certain of every detail that happened that night. And while this example seems rather fanciful, it is not significantly different from the real case of the murders of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson, in which the entire case against O.J. Simpson was based on circumstantial evidence. Of course, in that case, the jury found him not guilty, but I do not recall anyone saying, gee, there was nothing but circumstantial evidence, the jury did the right thing. And later in the civil trial, O.J. did take the stand and offer direct evidence that he did not commit the murders. That is, he said he didn't do it but in that case the jury chose to believe the circumstantial evidence. And you can see that you yourself likely form beliefs based on purely circumstantial evidence. For instance, there is no direct evidence that Andrew Irvin is dead. No one has found his body. No one saw him die. However, based on the circumstances surrounding his disappearance, it is reasonable to conclude that he is dead. And not just because he would be over 120 years old, but it is reasonable to conclude he died on Mount Everest in 1924 based on nothing more than the circumstantial evidence that he was last seen climbing the mountain and never seen after that. However, not all people accept this. In 2002, snowboarder Marco Sofredi disappeared while snowboarding down Mount Everest. Although he is generally believed to have perished, his sister firmly believes he survived the descent and is living with Tibetan yak herders. It is curious with the Mallory and Irvin climb that people tend to throw around the term circumstantial evidence as if it is some type of negative, such as your theory they made the summit is based on nothing but circumstantial evidence. While entirely true, the same can be said about, for instance, the theory of evolution. Charles Darwin observed the characteristics of various finches, and from those facts that he personally observed, he put together a theory a theory that will always be based on circumstantial evidence because no one person can physically observe evolution taking place. However, this is not to say that every single theory based on circumstantial evidence is worthwhile. In each case, you need to use your own common sense, and when you look at the evidence relating to the ice axe, it is not clear whether it belongs to Irvin. First, the circumstantial evidence is that the ice axe belonged to either Mallory or Irvin. No one other than Somerville and Norton is known to have been that high on Everest, and while Somerville lost his ice axe high on Everest, it was much further west, and the last sighting of Somerville's ice axe was when it was bounding down the mountain after having been dropped. Thus, using common sense, the circumstantial evidence is that the ice axe belonged to either Mallory and Irvin, and was not the one Somerville dropped or one that a Yeti found and put in that location. However, determining whether it was Mallory or Irvin's requires you to apply common sense to what is known. The ice axe was made by Willish of Tayish, which provided a number of ice axes to both the 1924 and 1933 expeditions. So just knowing the manufacturer tells us little about whose it was. 
The main argument for the ice axe being Irvin's is this photo, put out by the Sandy Irvin Trust, showing both the ice axe and a swagger stick with similar markings. The caption claims a swagger stick was Irvin's, and you can see the similarity between the markings. Therefore, one could conclude that the axe was Irvin's, except that both the claim that the swagger stick belonged to Irvin and that the true owner of the axe made the triple tick marks are both highly suspect. First, the swagger stick. The stick was found in 1962 among the belongings of Andrew Irvin's father, Willie, when he passed away. The other four sons did not remember having such a swagger stick, so it was assumed to belong to Sandy Irvin and passed on to Noel O'Dell, as one of the sons remembered the ice axe had a similar mark on it. Although there are plenty of other ways Andrew Irvin's father might have acquired a swagger stick at some point in his lifetime, even if we assume it was Irvin's, there are still a number of problems. First, the known ice axe of Irvin does not have any such marks, nor is it so distinct that marking it would not be necessary. It looks just like many other ice axes. More problematic is that when Wynn Harris initially found the ice axe, he did not notice any markings at all. Wynn Harris wrote, When I picked up the axe, there was no mark on it. The cross, over which there has been so much controversy, was not put on either by Mallory or Irvin. It was, in fact, cut by my personal Sherpa porter, Kasung Pugla, who did it under threats from me that it must not be lost or mixed up with other axes. And when Walt Unsworth, the author of the book Everest, The Mountaineering History, examined the axe, he noted, when the present author examined the axe in 1977, there were four sets of marks on it. In addition to those already described, there was the single horizontal tick above the three seen by Odell, and the three tick emblem was repeated, though fainter, on the side of the axe opposite Pugilus Cross. Unfortunately, there is no means of knowing whether these marks were there originally or were added later. Although when Harris is referencing the cross mark put on by a Sherpa, it is not clear why he would tell a Sherpa to put a mark on the axe if there were already the clearly defined uh, ticks seen in this photo. In addition, this photo does not show the second set of triple nick marks for comparison, and I have not had the opportunity to inspect the ice axe myself. Ultimately, we are left with a swagger stick that might have been Andrew Irvin's, having some marks on it that may have been put there by Andrew Irvin himself, and these match up with two sets out of four markings on an ice axe that had at least one of those four marks made by a Sherpa. In addition, none of the other items returned to Irvin's family had any of the markings. Perhaps the best explanation was provided by Willie Irvin, Andrew Irvin's father, back in 1933. As noticed, Wynne Harris did not notice the marks, and Odell was the first to notice them when the ice axe was brought back to England. Odell wrote to Ruth Mallory and Willie Irvin, inquiring about the marks. Ruth wrote that George did not mark his items in any manner. Willie wrote the following. Both Hugh and Evelyn think that Sandy used the triple nick, but they are not certain. I, too, have a feeling that it is familiar on the other hand, this may simply be an example of suggestion. That is from the third poll. Mark Sinnott goes on to summarize the rest of the letter from Willie Irvin. Willie goes on to say that he had searched through Sandy's things, including his skis, the ice axe he had used on the expedition to Spitsbergen, and his diaries, but he could find no example of the marking. He said that his son generally used a monogram, which he drew on the page. Most problematic is that Irvin's father did not mention the swagger stick that would later be used for the so-called proof that the axe belonged to Irvin. It seems that old Willie was right all along. This was simply an example of suggestion. Who the ice axe belonged to is not critical to any of my theories of the climb because Mallory was found directly below the ice axe location and was roped up when he fell. However, other theories require the ice axe to be Irvin's. For instance, the theory that Irvin left the axe on the ascent no longer works if it is Mallory's because it is difficult to believe that Mallory would leave his ice axe and either let Irvin lead the entire rest of the way or drop his axe and then borrow Irvin's. More problematic are the various theories about the hole that Mallory's head may or may not have had. In 1999, after Mallory was buried, two people returned to the grave two weeks later and dug Mallory up. The following is how Wade Davis describes it in the book Into the Silence. Tom Polar decided to examine Mallory's face. They pried up the cadaver like a frozen log, and Polar slithered on his back until his body lay supine beneath that of the corpse. The face, he reported, had been somewhat distorted by the weight of the snow over the years, but was otherwise perfectly preserved. Mallory's eyes were closed, and the stubble of his whiskers covered his chin. Over his left eye was a hole, with two pieces of skull protruding. Blood could still be seen. The theory is that Mallory was hit in the head by his ice axe while trying to arrest his descent. Obviously, this theory does not work if Mallory's ice axe was laying on the slabs above. Of course, much like Trotsky, 
the hole in the head has been eliminated because it is no longer convenient. It has been pointed out that one person accidentally stood on top of Mallory with his crampons while trying to dig out the body. Conrad Anker reports that Mallory was hit in the arm with an ice axe while they were trying to dig him up. Given that the various punctures of Mallory's body were caused by people digging him up, it is not unreasonable to think they may have accidentally also hit him in the head. Now, Mark Sinnott is not so sure there is even a hole in the head. Writing in the th third poll, note here, the hole has moved from the left to the right eye. But what if his right eye, Tom insists he saw a horrific wound, a hole about the size of a half dollar that went right through the skull with jagged edges rimmed with bits of bone and blood. I actually felt a sense of relief when I saw it, says Tom, because it was clearly a mortal wound. Whatever had caused it, Mallory could not have lived long afterwards. Tom considered taking a photo of Mallory's face, but after the photo that had been published in The Sun and all the outrage that had rained down on the team as a result, he balked. He would later regret his decision not to document the wound he saw in Mallory's head. Pollitz never saw it. He was searching the surrounding area to no avail with the metal detector at the time, and eyewitness accounts at high altitude are notoriously unreliable. When they were back at their tent that night and Tom brought it up, Pollitz didn't remember any mention of the wound while they were examining the body. Tom remains adamant that the wound was real and not a figment of his imagination or a play of shadows or his altitude addled eyes and he did record it in his journal shortly afterward. Most Everest historians have accepted this account, but the fact is that he and Pollitz did not flip the body over, so he never got a clear view of Mallory's face, and the existence of a gaping hole in the head potentially conflicts with the conclusions of others, including my own, that Mallory must have been conscious and still struggling to save himself before he succumbed. And with this, we get back to the assassination of Trotsky, and these so-called experts inserting their beliefs into the analysis. Trotsky was hit in the head with an ice axe. The axe went 2.75 inches into his skull, and it did not immediately kill him. Trotsky would live for a day and die in the hospital of the wound. Thus, the various analyses that the ice axe wound would be immediately fatal are based on nothing more than belief and are directly contradicted by what happened to Trotsky. This does not mean that an ice axe could not possibly have killed Mallory instantaneously, just that there are other realistic possibilities. Without more reliable information about the wound, the amount of blood around Mallory's head, I find it pointless to try to make any determinations as to how the hole got there, or even if it is there at all. So while investigating the ice axe, the supposedly known issue that it belonged to Irvin must now be put into the unknown column. But fortunately, the map provided by the 1933 team lets us cross off one of the unknowns. During the 2019 search, a location identified by Tom Holzell was searched to see if Irvin was there. Although that spot had been searched previously, and they had a drone photo that showed no body was there, for some reason Mark Sinnott decided to walk over and take a look at the slot. The slot turned out to be about 9 inches wide, and there was no way the body was ever there. However, this did not stop Hosell from stating that the reason it was not there is because the Chinese moved Irvin. However, this map shows that did not happen. The route of Frank Smythe in 1933 crosses directly over the Hosell slot, and as Smythe did not report tripping over Irvin's body, it is safe to conclude that it was not there in 1933, and thus the Chinese did not remove the body. The object Holzell claims to have seen in on his photo was nothing more than a rock. In terms of why the 2019 search expedition was given the proverbial ice axe from the museum exhibit, I suspect this is because the team engaged in their post-truth work. That is, three of the people on the team engaged in some type of creative work. Renan Ozturk made the video Ghost Above, Mark Sinnott wrote the book The Third Pole, and Tom Pollard has been engaging with social media. Each of these people appears to be engaged in post-truth work. That is, you cannot take what they say at face value. I will get into this in an upcoming review of The Third Pole, but the book is a thinking person's book, and you have to read between the lines of what he is saying to get at the truth. If you are not familiar with how this works, or not believe it is frequently done by authors in times of censorship, you might wish to read the book Philosophy Between the Lines by Arthur Meltzer. I will not review that book, but it is helpful to illustrate some of the techniques used in the third poll. I su suspect that someone got wind of what these people were doing and gave them the Trotsky treatment at the Nat Geo Museum. And as I have been frequently critical of the 1999 expedition, I will note that my next video will praise the work of one of the members of that expedition, Liesl Clark. Her research is fairly extensive, and she comes across as being honestly interested in determining whether Mallory and Irvin made it to the summit. Her analysis of the owner of the ice axe is largely similar to what I have outlined in this video. 
but her work goes beyond that of the other honest researchers on that expedition, namely Dave Hahn and Andy Politz, and thus I will name her the first hero of the climb for her work answering the biggest mystery about Mallory and Irvin. The biggest mystery is not whether they made the summit. That is hardly a mystery, and it is overwhelmingly likely that they made it. The largest mystery was whether the mistakes made by the 1999 team were from incompetence or were deliberate. Liza Clark answers that question, and I will get into it in the upcoming video. For those internet researchers that like to figure things out for themselves, I would encourage you to look into this as the answer can be found with just a few basic searches and has been hiding in plain sight this entire time. It would be best for you to find it on your own so that the feeling of betrayal can sink in slowly.